Now let's wrap up what we have learned in lecture two. So lecture two was in total 10 videos and we with this this lecture with this series of videos we refreshed the basics of microeconomics that are needed for for this course and we also learned some new tools so the tools that you've seen that we will need a lot in this course are the ones you most of you already know from intermediate micro which is constraint optimization and social efficiency such things as consumer surplus and producer surplus we will obviously do more than just looking at consumer and producer surpluses um, what i mean by that is we will also then think about well what uh, how are subsidies or taxes or price or quantity restrictions working in, in, in a market and what are the implications for, for distribution and for efficiency um, that we will do at a later stage in the course. So these are the standard microeconomic tools. Now we've also then learned a few new tools, um, namely uh, we learned about social welfare functions, whereby we what we're thinking about how to aggregate the utility of each person in the economy into one number, and that's social welfare. And there is obviously multiple ways of doing this. And we've learned about the two extreme cases. So we learned about utilitarian preferences where we simply add up all the utilities and it does not matter whose utility is high and whose utility is low. All we care about is what the overall size of the pie is. We've also learned about the other extreme that are Rolschen preferences where all we care about is the utility of the person who has the least in the economy or who consumes the least. And obviously, if that's if these are the social preferences, then what what immediately follows from that is that we want to have a distribution that is as equal as possible, no matter how big the pie is. And then there are obviously lots of social preferences that are somewhere in between those two extremes. And we can easily think about cases about groups or about entire societies that are closer to one or to the other type of, of, of social preference. We have also learned about Edgeworth boxes as a very compact way of visually analyzing general equilibrium. And you will see that even in some of the very advanced uh, economics research or theoretical research in economics, you will often see Edgeworth boxes. Now, Typically, the way this is done is uh, they prove something mathematically for a large number of goods and a large number of consumers, a large number of firms, but they show the intuition behind their proof within this stylized example of an Edgeworth box for just two consumers, two firms, two goods, um, something that can be visualized. So Edgeworth boxes, we will revisit a few times in different parts of the course because they're very, very useful. And we've already put them to very good use by analyzing or by talking about the two fundamental welfare theorems. So the first one going back to Adam Smith saying that if we leave a market to its own devices, if we don't intervene in a market, the market equilibrium that will come out of this, the so-called competitive equilibrium, is Pareto efficient and is efficiency maximizing. But we've also learned that in a perfect world, in what economists call a first best world, we can actually redistribute through lump sum transfers without having any efficiency loss. Now that is a that is a very very important insight but obviously we can think about many cases where the the conditions for this this theorem to hold are not fulfilled 
That does not mean that that, th that theorem is without insight and without value. It actually is quite the opposite. What we can rather think about is, well, what happens if it breaks down? And if some of the assumptions are not fulfilled, if there is information asymmetries, if uh, people can conceal their endowments, if, if it's not possible to redistribute, well, we can study those consequences. And then we are in, in the so-called second best world. And we can always say, well, you know, what are the limitations to redistribution in a given country or in a given society? And then we can think, well, to what extent is there the actual equity and efficiency trade-off? To what extent is it actually present? And uh, if it's a very severe trade-off, um, then that has different implications for, for a society relative to a situation where that, that trade-off is, is, is very mild. And, and we can basically redistribute uh, resources within and redistribute consumption within this economy without any uh, any major obstacles right so, so so there is no welfare losses or very very few so we can actually choose the distribution we want without shrinking the pie whereas if if the um, uh, if, if this trade-off is is quite a strong one then we may not be able to, to, to do this so easily. And, and the redistribution uh, is no free lunch in that, that, that case. To what extent this applies and how to measure this is, is a difficult question. So, you know, think tanks and, and uh, entire departments and ministries spend a lot of time and brain power on really trying to figure out how in a given country, in a given economic situation, how big that trade-off actually is. Um, but the important message here is that trade-off is likely there, but it can be strong or it can must or it need, but it need not be strong. So, so these are the main takeaways from, from lecture two. So with this lecture, we covered the, the, the basic tools of public economics. And uh, we will, in the next few lectures, put those tools to hopefully very good use.